Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to Mr. Saucedo's YouTube videos. Today we're going to be going over calorimetry and how to find how many calories there are in something. So please follow along with your notes and if you have any questions make sure that you ask tomorrow. Okay, so how are we going to measure how much energy there is in something? One of the ways to do that is to use a calorimeter. Now the word calorie comes from the Latin word uh, calor, which means heat or hot. And then uh, when you add meter to something, that means that we're going to be measuring it. All right, and so that's kind of that's kind of the way those work. Measurement. Um, it is actually the same device that dietitians use when they want to know how many calories are in some food. And so this is like the fancy calorimeter that dietitians use, where we find like nutrition label facts and how we kind of get that information. Uh, now here's the thing about them. They're called bomb calorimeters, and the reason why is because uh, even if, you know, sort of like a huge amount of energy is being released, like something from a bomb, uh, it would still stay sealed like this. And so it's sort of like the safest method of figuring out how many calories there are in something. Now the principle behind a calorimeter, though, is the law of conservation of energy. So the idea is that instead of measuring how much energy is directly in a food, Okay, and so the food would be like our system. It's really hard to do that. Um, for example, let's say that we had like, you know, a double-double with cheese or something from In-N-Out, and we wanted to know how many calories were in it. To figure out how many calories were in a burger or something, it would take an enormous amount of work because we'd have to know like every atom in the food, every arrangement, how they're bonded, and then we'd have to calculate and add up every single sort of bond and how much energy it takes to break it. So that is not a good way of figuring out how many calories are in something. But if we burn that food, if we release all of that energy and burn this, then we can actually measure how much energy moves into the surroundings. Because remember, those numbers should be equal. So the energy of the system, if it has nowhere else to go, all of that energy will get moved to the surroundings. Okay, and so uh, that's kind of the principle of the law of conservation of energy and also the principle behind a calorimeter. So if you know the energy that is in the surroundings or that has increased in the surroundings, then you knew how much energy was in the original system. And so that's the way a calorimeter works. You put a food item in the bottom here, okay, where it says a little sample and cup. You pump in some oxygen so that it is extremely flammable. You have ignition wires, which will create a flame, which will burst this into flames. Okay, and then you surround it in a jacket of water with water constantly sort of being stirred and circulating and then all of this heat will go from inside of this little cup outside into the water and that will change a thermometer's temperature by a measurable amount. And so by doing that we can figure out how much energy is now in this water that wasn't there before. So the energy in here goes up and we're assuming then that the energy in our system went down. Okay, and the amount that this energy in the system went down by is the exact same amount that the energy in the surroundings went up by because of the law of conservation of energy. Now, how are we going to make a calorimeter if we don't have one of these really fancy looking ones? Well, you can actually use a beaker or a styrofoam cup. Uh, styrofoam containers are notoriously good at maintaining heat. They don't really absorb any heat and they don't really, you know, sort of uh, release any heat. They're, they're good at keeping like kind of a constant uh, internal energy amount. And so it's actually pretty easy. And so the energy that heats up in the water, we can measure that as a change in temperature. So really all we need is a thermometer in order to do this and a scale. And I'll explain why. So here is our equation for calculating how many calories there are in something. Okay. Now here's the thing about it though. Each one of these letters means something obviously. But the big thing is that um, there are different units for energy. And so in the United States, we like using calories, but everywhere else in the world, we use joules. So what is Q? Q is heat, okay? And uh, that is measured in joules or in calories, if we're in, again, the United States. M is mass, okay? So that hasn't changed. And that is measured in grams. C we'll talk about in a second. But I want to talk about delta T. So delta T is the uh, temperature change. So how much does your temperature actually change? And of course, that is going to be measured in degrees Celsius. 
Okay, so what is C? C is a constant, and it's called the specific heat. So specific heat. It has the strangest units, so you probably want to write these down. It's joules per gram degree Celsius. That's actually its units. So specific heat is different for each substance. It is a constant. And so uh, this right here is definitely something new that we've never seen before. And so uh, we'll, we'll talk about it. But you can look up the specific heat for any substance. The most common is obviously water, since we use water in our calorimetry experiments to sort of absorb all of the heat. But uh, there are other specific heats out there that are also pretty common, like aluminum or copper. Every substance has its own specific heat. Even people have their own specific heat capacities. So just to give you a refresher again, if you wanted to see this sort of more typed out, uh, this is actually what we're talking about then, all right? Um, and so, like I said, specific heat or heat capacity. And so uh, this is not really anything that would be used, uh, but joules per gram degree Celsius, that's like the big science one. So the only time we'll ever really use this is if we were burning a food and we're trying to figure out how many calories there are inside of a food. So what is the definition of specific heat? Okay, so specific heat, or constant C, it's the amount of energy it takes to raise one gram of a substance by one degree Celsius. Okay, and so something that you need to commit to memory are these two pieces of information. Uh, the constant for water, so specific heat capacity of water, is 4.18 joules per gram degree Celsius, or one calorie per gram degree Celsius. Okay, so here's the thing about that. Uh, you can kind of see why we still like using, you know, this one in the United States. It's because um, 1 <laughs> makes our calculations really easy. If we have Q equals M times C times change in T, if C is 1, that makes it nice and easy. But the majority of the world uses joules, as you can see. This is an example of a nutrition label that you kind of see in another country. And so it has energy value in kilojoules. And it also has calories, though, which probably means it's also sold in the United States. So that whole calorie amount that we see in our nutrition labels looks a little bit different if you go to a different country. Okay, and so it says, note, joules is used, but in America we sometimes like to use calories instead. So there is sort of a difference there. Okay? Let's solve a couple of problems. So our big equation is Q equals MCAT. That's the way I remember it. So Q equals MCAT. Q is heat. M is mass, C is specific heat, and then we have change in temperature. So let's read our question here. What temperature change is produced from 50 grams of water absorbing 500 joules of heat? All right, so let's put that where it needs to go. So temperature change, I know that. 50 grams, that's mass. Water is absorbing 500 joules of energy, that is heat. Okay, and then all I really need here is to remember my constant for water. Okay, so let's plug in what we need and what we know. So I have 500 joules of energy. I have 50.0 grams. I know the specific heat capacity of water is 4.18, and that's joules per gram degree Celsius. And then I have my unknown, which is delta T. Okay, so all I've got to do is plug that in my calculator and solve for delta T. So what do we get delta T to be? Uh, when you do that out, delta T ends up being... Now, I'm going to give you the answer that, you know, you, you probably would have rounded to. We have about 2.4, and that would be degrees Celsius, okay? Now, if we were using significant figures, though, we only have one significant figure, so that's a little limiting. So it would be about 2 degrees Celsius. But again, most people would round probably to just one, you know, decimal place. But if uh, significant figures are important then it would be 2 degrees Celsius. Let's try another one. How many grams of water can be heated from 20 to 50 degrees Celsius using 340 joules of heat? All right, so let's use Q equals MCAT again. Let's underline our important information. How many grams of water are heated from 20 to 50 degrees Celsius using 340 joules of heat? All right, so how many grams of water? That's M. 20 to 50 degrees, that's my change in temperature. And using 340 joules of heat, that would be Q. So all I'm missing is C, but remember, I have to remember my constant for C. Let's plug in everything. So I have 340 joules. M, again, is our unknown. We have no idea what that is. C, 4.18 joules per gram degree Celsius. 
And then I have a difference here. So temperature change, how many degrees does it take to move from 20 degrees to 50 degrees? That is 30 degrees. That's the change in temperature. Remember, it's change in temperature, not just temperature. So once again, let's just solve for m. So when I solve for m, what do I get? Again, I get about 2.7 grams. And if we're using significant figures, again, we only have one significant figure, so that would round to just 3 grams. All right? um, and again, that's how we solve q equals mcap problems. All right, let's read another one. Uh, the heat capacity of aluminum is 0 0.900 joules per gram degree Celsius. How many joules of heat will be absorbed by a 10 gram block of aluminum if it's heated by 15 degrees Celsius? All right, so let's write down Q equals MCAT, since that's our formula. Uh, and let's start reading. The heat capacity of aluminum is, so it gives us a number, 0 0.900 joules per gram degree Celsius. How many joules of heat will be absorbed by a 10 gram block of aluminum if it's heated by 15 degrees so all of those things, important things that I know. So how many joules of heat? Don't know what that is. My mass, 10 grams. Heat capacity, well, sadly, this is not of water, so thankfully I didn't have to, like, remember what the heat capacity of aluminum is because it gives that to me. It'll always give you a heat capacity. It does not assume that you know it unless it is just water, okay? And then uh, we have our temperature change, 15 degrees Celsius. So again, when I work this out, all I've got to do is plug it into my calculator. Okay, so I have Q equaling 135 joules. One last time, there's only one significant figure in this, so that means that we would actually round that then to about 100 joules. That would be one significant figure. But again, most people would probably just keep it at 135. All right, so that's it for uh, calorimetry. And so be prepared to ask questions tomorrow if you have any questions. And uh, that's pretty much it.